Hi, and welcome to the 64th in our series on Middle Eastern Islamic history. Today, we're going to be finishing our discussion on Islamism and Jihadism. And let's, for those of you who are uninitiated, head over to the rules. Now, the rules are this. This is not an academic presentation. I am not accredited in history, religion, philosophy, or any of the topics that we're going to be discussing tonight. And I'm going to try and deliver this as a secular presentation, meaning that I'm not going to try and prejudice in favor of one side or the other side in a particular uh, in a particular war, in a particular combat, try and provide an objective historical analysis of what's going on. The next thing is that, of course, this is going to be a difficult topic. So let's be respectful, as we are in all of the other presentations. That said, I love interactivity. Questions, comments, clarifications, please put those in the chat. I do read the chat and will respond in real time. What I like to say is these classes or these presentations are 101s and 201s, meaning that if you don't know anything, trust me, I'll catch you up. And if you already know something, I will probably tell you things that you didn't know, and that will be your next level of education. I also have what I call a two hour hard stop. So at 9 p.m. Eastern time, I'm not gonna advance any more slides. Those slides that remain will be the discussion for next week and we will uh, go to the Q&A afterwards. You won't miss anything because it will start with the next uh, week with all those remaining slides. Now, any dates that I put below a person are typically their years of service if they're a politician. But if they are a philosopher or an ideologue, those will be their years of life. Now, this other entrance in the Middle Eastern and Islamic history series are going to be recorded. You can find those on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel in order to see all of the various presentations that we do. And if you want to be advised of upcoming uh, presentations, we post in a variety of meetups, but this meetup, New York Museum Food, um, is one that we regularly post in, and all of our events can be found there. So please join that meetup if you want to see all the presentations that our group, History Mostly Ancient Discussions, does. And of course, we have a premium Zoom account, a premium YouTube account, and a premium meetup account. And in order to keep the lights on, uh, we appreciate any donations that you feel that you should give based on the quality of the content that you're seeing today and other days. Of course, we're going to continue to op uh, offer this content for free. So there's no obligation. But please, if you feel that this is something that's improving your life, something that's interesting, it helps us in order to get the message out. All right. So last time when we were talking about Islamism, we discussed that there were five basic trajectories that we saw in the direction of uh, modernity, right? That in the Islamic world, there were four main modern trajectories that embraced a separation of church and state, uh, and that fundamentally led with a state-led authoritarian uh, leadership. Those were the liberals, the ethnic nationalists, the border nationalists, and the Arab socialists. And for a sort of a rundown on what those people believed, I would advise you to see episode 62 and the first part of episode 63. And then we started talking about the Islamists who believed in a firm unity where the state actually is derived from the religious uh, leaders. And so Islamism, just to go back to the definition, right? Islamism is not Islam. Islam is a religion. And that religion can be practiced with or without inclusion in a state apparatus, right? You can have Islam, for example, in the United States, that is completely separate from the United States government. But Islamism is a particular idea that Islam should be incorporated into the governing structure of a country. So Islamawiya is the Arabic term for Islamism, right? That's different from Islam, which is the word for Islam. And so what we're talking about today is Islamism, this theocratic modern nation state. And we talked about how Islamism came out of the Muslim modernist movement. And the Muslim modernist movement basically held to the idea that Islam is a faith that embraces scientific change and modernity. And because of that, Muslim states should be states where Islam is a ethical code which guides the state, the degree to which particular clerics or individuals uh, should be involved in the running of the state was disputed among Islamic modernists. 
but at the end of the day, they they felt that a secular ruler alone would be capricious and would be subject to his own personal will and desire, which many of the sultans of the Ottoman Empire were. So the Islamic modernists come into the post-World War I period, and they really can't explain the problems that the Islamic world is dealing with. And so they sort of break apart into two different groups. The first group, as we addressed, are the liberal secularists. We talked about them in episode 62. And the liberal secularists believed that something very similar to what was occurring in Europe and the United States should occur in the Islamic world, that you should have a state where religion and state are two separate entities, and that the state is itself a moral entity that has its own checks and balances and therefore protects the rights and duties of the people. But, le but starting with Rashid Rada, you had a number of individuals coming from the uh, Muslim modernist space that were saying, no, you can't have a modernist state that will protect Muslims. A modernist state, by definition, is going to be uh, negative to people's religious inclination, negative to people's religious growth and substantiation. And so you need to create a state that caters to the religious interest of the Muslim population. After Rashid Rida, we had Hassan al-Banna who began to define the Muslim people. And both of these individuals, Rida and Hassan al-Banna, were really bothered by the fact that in 1924, the caliphate was abolished. That's the, effectively, and of course there are meaningful distinctions, but in this case, it's uh, those distinctions aren't meaningful. The Pope of Islam, or rather the Pope of Sunni Islam, was removed by the Turkish government. And there was no leader of the worldwide Muslim community. So Hassan al-Banna decided to create the Muslim Brotherhood as an organization that could unite Muslims on their shared Muslim identity. And notice that Hassan al-Banna is fusing the concept of Muslim as a religious believer with an ethnic identity, right? That a Muslim has a specific part of a nation, right? That, that the Ummah isn't just a community of believers, but it is a nation in the sense of nationalism. It has its own political aspirations, goals, needs, and should move to exercise those. That's what Hassan al-Banna really brings to the fore. Uh, Abu Alam al-Dudi, based in Hyderabad in modern-day India, at that time it was a British colony, but he takes this idea and further runs with it by saying that the implementation of a state that caters to the nationalistic will of the Muslims, bringing about such a state is an act of religious sacrifice and religious struggle, using specifically the term jihad, right, uh, which is the Islamic religious idea of struggle to refer to this revolutionary aspect of creating a modern nation state on the foundations of the Islamic religion. And then probably the most famous uh, Islamist and really the one who galvanized and organized the movement as we understand it today, Said al-Qutb, he takes it to the next step of saying that the entire idea of secularism, the entire idea of church-state separation is fundamentally an idea which allows for excess and moral depravity. And accordingly, not only is creating an Islamist state a, a religiously require, uh, sorry, a religious requirement, but such a state should be organized according to certain principles in order to guide it in terms of the implementation of this theocracy. So we then talked about how coming out of the late 1960s with Israel's success in the Six-Day War, we had a massive amount of instability in the Islamic world, especially in the Middle East. You can see all of those coups. And the one group that had consistently opposed those secular states that had consistently argued that the Arab socialist movement, which had been building in the 1950s and 60s was doomed to fail because of its secularist leanings, those Islamists were able to gain a lot of public support in this period because they were arguing consistently, even when the Arab socialists were appearing to do well, that they were doomed to failure. And so they, they seemed like people who had made 
uh, fundamentally correct predictions. And they seemed like people who were moral at their very core because they stressed religious piety. We also noticed that in this exact same period that Islamists managed to gain more and more Western support and more and more Western acknowledgement of their existence because they became the fundamental uh, roadblock towards communist expansion into the region, left-wing expansion into the region. If there was one thing that Islamists and Western countries could agree upon, it was that communists were evil and needed to be stopped. From the Western perspective, of course, it has to fall into the entire Cold War dynamic and the, and the repression of human rights and, and all of these sorts of concepts. From the Islamist perspective, the communist issue was primarily that they were atheistic and that they saw in every Muslim territory that they occupied, such as Central Asia, they seemed to minimize the ability of religious people to organize, they seemed to minimize the ability of religious people to uh, promote the religion, and they seemed thoroughly amoral or immoral in terms of their legislative activities and their command economy structure. So we then talked about how the Saudis began to invest in the creation of worldwide mosques and other apparatuses starting in 1962. We talked about the formation of Midigurish, which was a Turkish Islamist organization that was actually banned inside of Turkey, but found refuge in Europe because of the human rights principles that existed in Europe that don't exist in Turkey. And therefore these organizations could grow and amass members, especially among the Turkish diaspora living in Germany. That Turkish diaspora today is 4 million people of whom several uh, tens of thousands are members of Miligurish. We then talked about how Israel's success really drove a wedge um, in the Arab world, and Israel's success also led to Hamas ascending through the ranks and becoming a viable competitor to the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was an Arab socialist organization, Hamas being an Islamist organization, a jihadist organization. And a jihadist, if we remember, is an Islamist who believes that the only way to create an Islamist state is through violent revolution. We talked about that increasingly during the 1970s, we see Islamism coming into the political governance of various states. Pakistan is probably the first state that truly goes Islamist with the reign of Muhammad Zia al -Huk. Um, but of course, in the late 1970s, we also have the Mujahideen who prevail in Afghanistan, the Islamic Revolution in Iran, and the re response to these, uh, these increasing changes where more and more states are on the cusp of or going Islamist is that the Arab socialist leaders that had been in power began to become more like generals. Uh, who would rule as military leaders rather than as Arab socialists. But what does that mean? It means that they abandoned this idea of increasing prosperity for the local population. It means that they begin to allow for traditional landowners to resume and westernization to continue. It means that they seek out Islamist underground groups and repress them thoroughly. And it means that they stop using the legitimation uh, that Arab socialists did, which was namely that they were anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist, that they were saving the Arab people from the West, and they start legitimizing themselves strictly based on the power that they can exert over the country. Now, there's a question here, did the Islamization of Pakistan have anything to do with Saudi investment? That's a really great question. It's hard to demonstrate the exact links. It's not as if Saudi sent agents, for example, into Pakistan. But we know that the Saudi government started allowing Pakistanis to uh, study in Saudi Arabia at a very reduced cost as early as the 1950s. Um, but it really accelerates in the 1960s. And so by 1978, there was certainly a core within Pakistan of Islamist influence some of that coming from Saudi Arabia on the one side, and some of that coming from Jamaat Islami, uh, the Islamic uh, society, which was the political party founded by Maududi in India at that time. Remember, India was united until 1947 when independence led to the state being divided. And Maududi, of course, sided with Pakistan. 
uh, moved uh, to Pakistan and began to foment the party there. And that party was integral um, to Zia al Haq taking leadership. So it was both indigenous uh, Islamist self propagation. And I imagine that the education of a number of Pakistanis in Saudi Arabia would also have uh, an effect in promoting that. So that's a really great question. So where we left off last time was that we now have these Islamist states in power, right? We have the Taliban in Afghanistan. We have the government in Iran um, declaring itself the Islamic Republic. What do they do now that they have the power? Because it's very easy when you're outside of power to criticize the way that a particular government is running things. It's much harder when you actually have the reins of government what you do with that power. And so the fundamental philosophy or vilayat faqi the state of the jurist that underlines the Shiite Islamist revolution in Iran, really began to call out to what was the legitimation, what was the way that the state was going to run. And the first thing that we really see from Iran almost consistently after the revolution is that Iran has an imperialist impulse. It has an expansionist impulse, and they would probably categorize it very similarly to the way the communists described worldwide revolution. Of course, it wouldn't be a worldwide revolution. It would be within the Islamic world, but that's still a significant amount of countries, a significant amount of people. So Iran begins this attempt to expand its influence and to Shiitify or Islamize one or the other, uh, a number of Muslim-majority states that had, at least at that time, secular-oriented governments. You can see the first rapprochement that he's able to make successfully is with the Syrians. Hafez al-Assad was having a legitimacy crisis in Syria. And the legitimacy crisis he was having was that he had switched, in many respects, from being an Arab socialist of the Ba'ath party. He was still a member of the party, but he wasn't promoting the slogans anymore. And he had taken control of the country directly as a military general. But the real issue that he had to his legitimacy was not that he strictly abandoned Arab socialism, but that he himself was not a Muslim. He was an Alawite. Now, there's a debate, of course, whether Alawites are Muslims. I have argued throughout this series that Alawites are a post-Islamic religion. You can think of that in the same way that Mormons are a post-Christian religion. They share a number of fundamental beliefs, but the religion itself has a number of beliefs that are discordant with the traditional beliefs of the parent religion, and therefore it sort of sits in this limbo of not exactly being a new religion, but at the same time not being uh, terribly different. Now, Hafiz al-Assad, and later his son Bashar al-Assad, um, who is the current ruler of Iran, are, indi are individuals of this Alawite religion. And so he needed to claim at least to be Muslim in order to gain the support of the Muslim majority of the populations. Uh, uh, Syria is over 75% Sunni. So Khomeini in Iran saw an opportunity to expand his influence through this relationship with Syria. Syria was looking for a regional partner. They wanted to stay outside of the West control. And so what ends up happening is that Khomeini certifies and legitimizes Assad as a 12er Shiite Muslim. He says that the Alawite religion is for part of Shiite Islam. And in return, Hafiz al-Assad allows that regional power projection. So we have this connection. Now, the next point is that the Taliban rule Afghanistan. And we discussed last time the human rights issues that began to crop up. Those human rights issues um, are extremely important and 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 show the degree to which they would the Taliban would impose uh their beliefs on the local population this is different from Iran where in Iran they didn't have the same degree of women's rights issues that said the iconoclasm in 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 Sunni Islam is different than the than the lack of iconoclasm in Shiite Islam and so you see the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas in Taliban run Afghanistan now one of the really unique things, though, about the Taliban is they begin to differentiate, politically speaking, between Islamism as a 
international movement. Hassan al-Banna, remember, with his Muslim Brotherhood, wanted to bring all the Muslims together around the world, and a national Islamism. The Taliban were only ever interested in controlling areas that were either Afghan or Pashto speaking. And so they never saw a desire to expand outside of those borders, never saw a desire for worldwide revolution, which was unique among Islamist organizations at that point. Um, there's a question that happened prior to 2021. I forgot to update this slide. It's 2001. We talked about the Algerian civil war. And so this is where we were left. We were left at Erdoganism. Erdogan was the first Islamist party to really win an election. And unlike the Algerians, that election didn't provoke a civil war. So unlike uh, Iran or Afghanistan, there was no revolution. There was simply an election. And the AK party, the Freedom and Justice Party, um, became the dominant party in the Turkish parliament. And Erdoganism, as opposed to Erbakanism, was much more diluted. The Islamism was much weaker. There, there are some things, like, for example, Erdogan, when trying to resolve the debt crisis uh, a year and a half ago, said that he couldn't increase the interest rate because that would be a violation of the Islamic view on usury. He had some curfews on selling alcohol. But by and large, he didn't disrupt uh, Turkey's fundamental religious structure, or rather its anti-religious structure. In fact, he kept the Dianet, which is the Turkish religious ministry, which controls the various mosques in the country. He decided to move in the direction of Islamic culture. He wanted to promote an Islamic culture in Turkey rather than actually deliver Islamic law as the law of the country, which is a huge difference between him and Erbakan, the founder of Miligurish. And he legitimated the cultural success of Islam with the economic success of Turkey, which of course didn't play as well for him in the most recent elections because the Turkish economy is not doing as well. However, his party has not been voted completely out of power uh, since 2002. We also saw the election of another Islamist in 2012, that's Mohamed Morsi. Mohamed Morsi was in power for about a year before he was removed by a coup d'etat led by one of the generals who, again, reinstituted this caudioization. Now, the point I want to make about Morsi is that his stance on Islamism was strongly counterbalanced by a number of the other parties in the parliament that began to argue about the ridiculousness of what he was promoting. One particular such example was when he was arguing about alcohol, the alcohol tax that he wanted to implement, right? Alcohol is illegal in Islam, but the argument against him was, first of all, Egypt has a 10% Christian population. And furthermore, European tourists come to Egypt all the time. That's the lifeblood of the economy. If you ban alcohol, European tourists won't come. And so there's a long set of hilarious videos on him on YouTube saying, in his very broken English, gas and alcohol don't mix. The rest of the speech is in Arabic, but that you'll be able to pick out. And Egyptian commentators made quite a bit of hay of that. Another thing I want to point out is that the Islamists didn't win the vote outright. Mohamed Morsi uh, won the first round with 24.78% of the vote. But a number of other individuals, like uh, uh, sorry, Ahmed Shafiq, who was himself another Chaldeo, uh, Ham Hamdin Sabahi, who was a Nasserist, Amr Musa, who was a traditional secular diplomat, if you added them together, they got over 50% of the vote. So it's not as if secularism was a undesirable position in Egypt. It just happened that after all of those other candidates were eliminated at the end of the first round, that most of those votes ended up going to Morsi. But people in general are dissatisfied with Islamism and what it has been doing in terms of their countries. In Iran, it's resulted in a number of rep uh, repression actions. And so you see solidarity marches and similar. You also see that in Egypt, the Anahda party, the Islamist party in their government, had to run an even more watered down uh, formula than Erdogan did in order to gain solidarity among the Tunisian people. You also have direct commentators against Islamism. Probably the most famous of these is Hossein Khomeini, the grandson of Ayatollah Ruola Khomeini, who lives in Iran, um, but is incredibly critical of the, Islam, uh, the Islamist style of governance, saying that Iran has become an atheist production facility 
because people identify Islam with the government. They don't like the government. Therefore, they don't like Islam. And therefore, they're leaving Islam, not because of any theological failing on Islam's part, but because of political failings. And he wants those two things separated. There's also been an incredible push by liberals in the Islamic world against Islamism, showing how bereft it is of ideas and development. Uh, Faisal Saeed al-Mutar is one individual who was born in Baghdad and created the Ideas Beyond Borders organization to help translate Western literature into Arabic, Urdu, and other languages in order to promulgate that throughout the Islamic world and show people that there's another, another way. And his books are very well received. So... We then move into the next stage of Islamism, which is this idea of the non-state actor who is uh, Islamist. In particular, I wanted to pay attention to Al-Qaeda, which was an organization that started with its roots in the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, combined with uh, a wealthy Saudi Arabian named Osama bin Laden, who came to Afghanistan in order to coordinate the activities of these individuals and provide the ideological basis for their struggle, right? He was following in Maududi's footsteps of equating their action to an Islamic action. Now, of course, he is most famous in the United States and around the world for his attack on the World Trade Center, which took place on the 11th of September 2001, and started uh, an incredibly robust response from the United States in the Middle East, an invasion of Afghanistan, a subsequent invasion of Iraq, and many other uh, events, but Al Qaeda, as you can see from the map, has engaged in targets all throughout the world. In fact, in 1997, they had bombed the U.S. embassies in Kenya and in Tanzania, in Africa. There were actions in the Philippines, in Ecuador. There are a number of different operations that they did, all with the purpose of attacking the West and asserting the primacy of Islamic law uh, being imposed around the world. Now, one of the things that's really interesting in terms of the organization of Al-Qaeda is that they developed the concept of the autonomous cell. And so the different cells of Al-Qaeda, when moved throughout the world, did were able to operate on their own and therefore limited communications and limited uh, connectivity between those different cells made it very hard for law enforcement officers to, if they arrested one cell, to discover information about other cells. They also used the fact that they did these violent attacks as their calling card that would entice individuals who felt the same way that they did, that Islamic law should be enshrined as the national law of countries and that imperialist influence from the West should be discarded to join them and that their violence was sincerity in their belief of their cause. They weren't just arguing on, on in documents, they were actually doing something about it. One of the complex things that Al-Qaeda developed was the concept of franchises. In, uh, in 2014, as you can see on the map, Al-Qaeda had franchises all around the world. All those red dots are organizations that did not respond directly to Osama bin Laden. They didn't have a formal escalation chain, if you want to think of it in a business perspective. But they were local rebel organizations that were Islamist in nature and chose to call themselves Al-Qaeda with the approval of individuals like bin Laden and so that they could carry the name. Of course, bin Laden was dead in 2014. At that time, it was Ayman al-Dawahiri, but same idea. So these organizations, like, for example, the one in Mali, which was the Azawad Rebellion, they called themselves Al-Qaeda. There's a group in Algeria, Al-Qaeda Islamic Maghreb. There's the group of Boko Haram in northern Nigeria, all across the world, these organizations took up Al-Qaeda as a franchising opportunity to show that they were part of this worldwide Islamic revolution and therefore grant legitimacy to their operations. At the same time, it further emboldened the stance of Al-Qaeda leadership because it showed that their revolution was spreading. When we get to 2006 and 2007, something really fascinating or scary uh, happens. And that is that jihadist organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah become actual state authorities. They take over territory and they now actually have to govern. And similar to Iran with the Vilayat al and having to prove that they could actually govern with their ideology, the Islamists um, who 
originally were opposing states, right? Hamas is designed to overthrow Israel. Hezbollah is designed to overthrow the Christian control of Lebanon. These organizations are now running states, and so they have to actually build the state. So what ends up happening is that you have what I what you can imagine as full service jihadism. Not only are they militant organizations, they are also educational organizations. Hezbollah and Hamas build numerous schools. They build universities. We saw um, Islamic University in, in Gaza in 19, that was built in 1979, operated by Hamas. Hamas also runs a number of hospitals. You can see there, it's a picture of the hospital in Beit Hanun. And Hamas was going in to award those doctors for valiant service in the most recent uh, action against Israel in 2021. You also have bureaucrats. The Taliban fighters are now, since 2021, when the United States withdrew and the Taliban were able to retake control of Afghanistan, they are now working as bureaucrats. They write ledgers, they check on, on property deeds, they hear criminal cases in court. They do all of the things that a state apparatus does. In fact, if you look at the cost and expenditure of organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah, the military part of it is actually less now than all of these social apparatuses. In effect, these jihadist organizations have had to become full service organizations that run the organ uh, that run the government and run the social welfare of the region. In fact, those actions help to legitimize themselves among populations where they might have a more uh, negative perspective without these services. A perfect example is that Hezbollah controls the Bakaa Valley, which is an which is a valley with a large non Shiite population, mostly Christian and Sunni. But despite that, and Hezbollah's orientation is Shiite Islamism, because they've created so many of these institutions, they have a relatively positive uh, appraisal in the region because of those social welfare institutions. We then have the next stage in the jihadist organization, which is uh, Islamic State. Now, Islamic State is a jihad state, and if we remember from our discussions of the Mahdi, um, there are a number of things that apply from the Mahdist state, which occurred in Sudan, to the jihad state, even though the underlying ideology is different. The first one that they share in common is coinage. Islamic State produced its own coins, so did the jihad state. They had their own flag, their own army. But perhaps the biggest thing that they share in common is that they can never be at peace with their neighbors. The Mahdists, for example, were fighting with the Ethiopians in the east, the Eritreans as well, the Egyptians to the north, the Belgians in the Congo to the south. Um, they could not be at peace with their neighbors because they couldn't accept the idea of non-Islamist, non-jihadist states existing, which is very different from Hamas and Hezbollah, which do have relations with other states. So you end up with this kind of state, but Islamic State understood the internet at a much more effective level than any of the other jihadist organizations did. They began to promote themselves on Twitter and other internet platforms. They began to show videos, and those videos often were highly edited and organized in such a way that they could galvanize the edge case person to join their organization. In fact, when they controlled the area of northern Iraq and Syria, in, 20, uh, in 2014 to 2018, they were able to recruit from over 50 different countries, all because of their outreach programs. Now, one of the things that we often hear is that Islamic State had self-radicalization, but I don't think that that's a really great term for what they had. What they actually had was a very pointed radicalization process. If somebody came across their materials, if somebody uh, showed any interest or awareness of Islamic State, then they would put somebody on the other end of their computer and engage in a conversation with this person, a long-term conversation that would slowly begin to bend that person's mind towards the religio-political principles of Islamic State. And because of that, they would then begin to say, oh, by the way, have you read this book? Have you seen this thing? Have you done this thing? Have you uh, 
do you need help getting flights? Oh, let's help coordinate that. And so instead of being self-radicalization, it's actually very similar to the YouTube algorithm or to any other of these sorts of methods by which a person through no personal agency is increasingly interested in following to uh, somebody to the bottom of the rabbit hole and acceding to a mental status that they wouldn't have otherwise done. Okay. There's a question of how did these franchising organizations eventually state control uh, justify the true meaning of Islam? They argued that their revolutionary activity would eventually bring about the peaceful Islamic state and a state that is free of ideological contradictions, a state that is free of historical contradictions, that people would live true and meaningful lives. It's actually very similar to the justification for the Puritans. All right. So now that we finished the Islamist portion, are there any questions, comments, or clarifications on that before we go to Israel? Oh, hold on, uh, Rich, Richard. Can you uh, comment on the um, the brides? That how does that work usually with uh, ladies, especially 14, 15 years old, leaving Western co countries to go into the um, like the Syria or Iraq? Um, I know there's several movies out there, but how does the recruiting work? And do they marry into this, um, so to speak, uh, you know, uh, jihadists, or uh, how does it work? Okay, well, there's sort of two things going on here. The first one is that when you have these young brides, so a lot of them are local, so they don't have to be brought over. They're taken by force. As for the women who are lured over for ideological reasons, those women are usually targeted by self-radicalization in that they're told that their life that they currently have in the West is one that's broken, uh, one that's causing serious problems. And so if they submit to the will of a man in the way that traditional Islam teaches, and of course, the traditional Islam that they're talking about is that which has been expounded upon by Islamist aligned scholars, right? So they're directing these women to specifically the knowledge spaces that they would use as opposed to, let's say, a more modern Islamic scholar like Yusuf Qadri or, uh, or, or for example. Um, so they're going for something like that. And in this view, the woman is told that she has to be submissive and then her world will be so much better. And you know what? You can do that in Islam in, in Islamic State. Just come on over. That's sort of the argument. So there, let me tell you a little bit about who we are as a group. So this is Middle Eastern Islamic history. I am Richard Sassoon, and uh, we meet on Wednesdays at 7. Uh, next week, we're going to continue with Israel and bring it up to the present day. We have a number of other series that on our channel, like uh, Jason Pung's Asian philosophy. Um, Aaron and I periodically do an episode on European Union security. Uh, we just had an episode from Dead Languages from John Maloney on Hebrew, uh, the biblical he, uh, form of Hebrew. Jane and, and John uh, do Powerful Women in Dead Languages every month. And there are a number of short-run series like our coverage of the Russo-Ukrainian War. And, uh, and we should get back to that probably in April or May. And we have a number of older series that you can see on our YouTube page. So the link for that is down below. All right. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'm going to close it out unless there are further questions. <laughs>